The great Larry Drew II joining us here on Locked On Bruins, a true redemption story, a guy that really was able to turn around his career with UCLA. Larry, thanks so much for taking the time. And how are you doing? How's your family doing during all that's going on with the coronavirus situation? Everybody's doing well, um, you know, taking the necessary efforts to stay, uh, stay safe, stay healthy, you know, in quarantine. Give us a sense of what you're doing right now and how you're spending each day. Huh. Well, these days, um, you know, pretty much like like everybody else, uh, home cooking a lot. Um, you know, I live with my girlfriend, so we, uh, you know, we're you know we're on the Nintendo Switch. You know, we play Mario sure. Party a lot. You know, we uh, uh, she she's an artist, so she paints. You know, I have a we have an in home studio at our house in Granada Hills, so we um, you know, we kind of get to stay busy, stay creative. You know, with each other. Um, she paints and I do music, so you tell me about this music career that you've got going on. Cause I know this has been a, a passion of yours for quite some time. Yeah, it has. Um, actually it was over the course of my collegiate career. I kind of found a passion for, uh, for music and I got into the studio during some of my off time from the court and, you know, kind of just, I was in a booth a lot more, um, writing and, and, you know, exploring my artistry, um, behind the mic. And it's actually, I've kind of, transferred a little bit more behind the scenes now in terms of you know executive producing or helping like other mm-hmm. artists or other people kind of like curate their sounds or like their music or you know even music videos um i've invested a lot of of, of you know the money i've made from basketball into you know various uh, equipment from cameras lenses uh, all types of you know things that we can use in the recording in the music session so um, I started a production company um, and, you know, it's just kind of a, you know, all around production, you know, from music to, to film, videography um, and photography. So, Larry Drew II joins us here on Locked on Bruins. I'm Brian Fenley. Larry, how can people listen to your music in, in ways in which that they can follow you in your exploits in, in your musical career? As of right now, um, you know, it's funny to shoot your eyes because, you know, I've been uh i I've, I've been recording i've been working on a catalog for the last couple of years and you know for me one of the things has just been timing uh you know i'm not one of those people that's you know obviously i'm not doing this because i i want to be like a famous rapper or anything you know i'm i'm, I'm more so you know like i said earlier um more invested to like my artistry long term than as opposed to just trying to like you know run up some numbers right so i'm 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 thinking of a a larger play at hand and how i can incorporate the music that i've been you know working on um into like you know more of a mainstream media you know so to speak uh, type of a way so um at this point there's no i don't have any music out i don't have anything that's out i haven't released anything like i said it's just been more so for me um in my catalog and, and me trying to figure out how I can like, uh, you know, maneuver, you know, within the entertainment realm as a whole going forward. And you're doing this too, while having played basketball, which had taken a lot of your time and throughout the years, you incorporate a lot of music in your life. Are you still incorporating basketball in your life? And you still have, you know, so many years in front of you to want to play. Where are your passions there? I mean, basketball is, is always going to be, you know, my first love, my first true love, you know. Um, and as far as, you know, where the game stands in my life now, I haven't been in the, the basketball gym as much. Uh, I want to say it was about a year and a half, almost two summers ago. The last time I was actually playing was in the summer league uh, 2018, and I was with the Pistons. Um, I actually had a, like a, a back spasm during the summer league which actually took me out of the summer league in the duration of that summer league um and what i ended up doing was uh, i ended up coming back home to la i recovered i got back to where i was supposed to be and then i actually signed a uh, a deal to go to south korea and go play in south korea and i was a couple of days removed from actually flying out to south korea and then i get a call from my agent and he's like yo there's a there's a problem with the deal turns out um the NBA website had me playing in one more game than, or, or yeah, they had me playing in one more game than what was allowed for me to be eligible to play in South Korea. Really? 
Oh. And like, long story short, my deal fell apart like last minute. And, you know, I kind of just took that as an opportunity to kind of reflect, you know, I, you know, I look at everything as an opportunity, right? Um, sure. You know, I, my back wasn't all the way where it should have been. And I knew that I was kind of just chasing the check at that point to go to South Korea. Sure. Um, didn't want to do the G League anymore. Um, but, but then, you know, after that deal fell apart, I kind of just looked at it as an opportunity to, you know, uh, take more initiative in other parts of my life, you know, the music, the entertainment side, um, and just see, you know, what plays I can make. You know, Absolutely. on that side, yeah, the way, I, the way I live my life, man, is, is you know, I'm a point guard in everything that I do, right? In the, 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 the skill set right. and, you know, the intuition that I have, or, uh, you know, I've, I've learned from basketball. I've, I've realized I'm able to, like, transfer, transfer it over into, like, the real world and, like, you know, the business side of, of, of how I can, you know, be an entrepreneur and, you know, make things happen and make plays happen, you know, not just for myself, but for other people. Just like a quarterback. I mean, you're the quarterback of the offense as a point guard on the, on the basketball court, the quarterback in life. You're making plays for other people outside of the basketball realm. I want to talk about your UCLA career. I mean, the change of scenery helped you so much. I mean, you seem to have a lot of fun playing. You're, you had a career high in minutes and field goal percentage and three-point field goal percentage, and your assist numbers were just incredible. And you were right up there top the nation in your assisted turnover ratio and all of these things. How would you – categorize that one season in Westwood and, and I, I'm I'm selfish here I wish we had more of you than one year that's for sure <laughs> yeah, yeah no, I mean it's it was it was an extremely extremely uh special year for me and you know coming from the ACC where you know I I, I gave it a shot at you know at, at North Carolina um things didn't go the way you know I was you know I was hoping for them to go so with me coming back home only having one year left, but in the way that, you know, the, the Bruin family, Coach Holland and everybody kind of just, you know, accepted me. And, and I, I remember that first phone call I got from Coach Holland. He was like, um, you know, we have a scholarship available for you. Um, and you would be the only senior on the team really full of, of, of freshmen, right? And, you know, he was, you know, gearing up to have a really good, you know, freshman recruiting class that year. You know, we had Kyle, Jordan, Shabazz, everybody. Um, the Warrior Twins were back, you know. Uh, we had all played together. Um, in AAU, it was just kind of like being home, man. And sure. It's, it's it's one of those things where it's like you know I wish, uh, you know, it, or not that I wish. If I would have known the things that I know now, in hindsight, maybe would have did some things differently. Sure. Um, but you know, everything happens for a reason, and like I said, it was just a very very special year for me. And you know, I was able to you know play with a with a with a ton of great guys. You know, like I said, all all the players that I mentioned before, the coaching staff was great. And you know, I had a, I had a you know a lot of fun playing in front of in front of my fan, my friends and family. Oh, well, we had a lot of fun watching you as a Bruin, and we certainly, as I said, we're selfish. We wish we had more of you. And I know you were recruited by UCLA coming out of high school. It didn't work out. I want to ask you about how Ben Hallen made it up to you when he finally brought you on, and and how he was. So almost apologetic in that he wishes he had you early on in your career because what your, your, your time in North Carolina, what did you learn from that experience and the approach that, you know, like you said, we all wish we could have done things differently in our past, but what led you to say, you know what, I know that there's a better spot for me. Well, I mean, this this is the era before like Twitter, Instagram, like you know the whole viral videos and sensations. Sure. Like nowadays, like dudes had you know entire mixtapes and highlight tapes, and like I think the only available like mixtape or like people that were actually putting together compilations of players' and tapes back then was was Ballers Life, right? And I used to watch Ballers Life mm -hmm. all the time. Sure. But I guess like I, I say that to say, um, you know. I, 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 there weren't as many friends back then. You know what I'm saying? Sure. From, a, from a competitive standpoint, a lot of the players and, you know, the, uh, from a competitive standpoint, even like the OA class, me, Jeremy, Brandon Jennings, Damar, Drew, Malcolm Lee, all of those kind of guys. Like, you know, we, we had all obviously played against each other growing up, um, you know, knew each other's games and were, you know, all, all had, you know, rivalries kind of going amongst one another. And at that point in time in my life, I looked at it as an opportunity to kind of get out of California 
and sure. kind of make my name and my stamp in another place and kind of just showcase not only to like, you know, the, the world, right? But just like to myself that I, I didn't, you know, I used to hear those stories like, oh, guys from the West Coast, like, you know, they're soft, you know, they have to stay on the West Coast. That, 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 that. I, used to, I used to pay attention to a lot of that kind of talk. Right? Sure. And it kind of motivated me to want to get out of the Pac-12 and like, you know, it, it wasn't my, my, my primary reason for, for going to the AC, ACC, but it was, it was one motivating factor for me. Um, you know, but then it's like, same time, that was just me being like young and naive because little did I know that most of those, <laughs> the things that I used to hear about, especially like going to like the ACC in like North Carolina, um, there was like this, it's, it's like a stigma against like players on the West Coast or whatever the case may be. I, I, I found myself in a position where I was, you know, obviously I was away from home. Um, I was in a new environment, in a new setting. Um, and the, the, the way the communication was relayed between the organization from the top to bottom wasn't what I was used to. It wasn't sure. more so the, like the style of play or anything basketball related. It was just more so the a, a communicative, uh, I guess, disconnect that I, I wasn't, I wasn't like, I, I didn't expect. Right. So sure. I, uh, when I left, I didn't really know, like I had no idea where I was going to go. I, I pretty much just, you know, left abruptly kind of just to, 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 you know, to, to get my mind back to, to the place to where it was prior to me getting to, you know, to, to North Carolina. And I was on the road actually um, headed to Atlanta because I had my car. I had put everything in my car. Um, you know, I had drove to Atlanta. Me and my mother, we drove to Atlanta. We dropped off the car in Atlanta with my dad, who was the head coach for the Hawks at the time. And I was going to take a sure. flight from Atlanta back to L.A. But then I remember, like, as we're on the road to Atlanta, the story breaks. And like I said, maybe five minutes later, you know, I get a phone call and it's, uh, it's Coach Howland. And Coach wow. Howland, you know, like, he's, like, he's like, Larry, like, it, it was, I guess it was like just as thrill for him as it was for me because sure. like, like, like right away, he was like, look, we have, well, he apologized, you know, like the whole thing made it seem like, you know, he could have recruited differently or whatever the case may be. But, you know, we both were happy, I guess, to like hear each other's voices, right? Again, because yeah. like we, we had a great relationship, like, you know, throughout high school and the recruiting process and the whole thing. So um, I was just excited to get back to UCLA as he was excited for me to get there. You know, it was just one of those mutual things. And, you know, I like – you couldn't have written it any better for me, you know? So, um, and I had the year to red shirt. I didn't have to like come in right away. And, like I was in pressure to like play. I got to like kind of, you know, get my feet underneath me again and learn the system and kind of like gain everybody's trust on campus about, you know, why they, or why Coach Allen at least, you know, felt it necessary to, you know, to have me back, you know, that year. As you know, like he stated, the, the only senior on the team, you know, like the point guard running the show with, you know, this very, very talented, recruiting uh freshman recruiting class so it was it was fun man it was fun it was like a movie <laughs> yeah well I, loved that. I, I had a great time yeah i mean and you were doing it right in the the backdrop of hollywood like, like, like the, the the newly renovated poly like you know everything kind of was just like building up to that year like my red shirt year we were playing at a uh, the sports arena like downtown pretty much like we were it was like a it was like a usc game you know it's like yeah. right next to usc's campus so we pretty much like had all the away games like the red shirt year that I was there. Um and it you know, it was it was it was one of those seasons that, you know, everybody felt like, you know, they could have did better, you know, maybe underachieved a little bit. So, you know, that was all motivation for me coming in for that that last year. You on that one season you were with UCLA, you broke Pooh Richardson school record for most assists. You were all Pac-12 first team and you in September leading into that season coach Allen said hey you're going to be the starting point guard and called you quote the most indispensable player on the team how did that make you feel going into that that year where you knew you had a chance to really redeem your, yourself like I said, it was, it was, it was like, for me, nobody could have written it any better than, than that. Right. It was like the perfect setup. And, um, like I said, I'm, I'm back home. I'm back in front of friends and family. I'm, I'm back playing in like the new poly pavilion. 
Um, you know, it, it was just this very, very energetic time period in my life where I, you know, I, was, I really had this chip on my shoulder and I wanted to like, you know, like I said, prove to, you know, you know, myself, you know, more than anything that, you know, I was, I was capable of getting to the next level because that's what it was always about for me. Right. Um, you know, playing at the highest level, competing in the NBA and, you know, whether I got there in one year, five years, 10 years, however long it was going to take me, like I knew that I had it in me to actually get there. Right. So, you know, that was definitely a springboard for me, um, especially mentally, emotionally for my confidence and in, in, in moving forward. So you got to the NBA, you started out in the summer league, if I'm not mistaken with the Miami heat and like you said, spent some time in the G League where you were with the 76ers, the Pelicans, even with the, the Heat, as I said. How would you sum up your time in the NBA? Because you were thrust into some situations where you made impacts and you basically had to be a little bit more well-traveled because you were bouncing around a little bit to different teams. Yeah, I mean, it was the ultimate humbling experience, you know. It was just one of those uh... – I mean, it's it, it it was so I was I was elated, right? Like I remember it was the game after the Christmas game, uh, twenty fifteen. I believe I I broke the G League record for assists in a single game. I had twenty three assists, and wow. it was like I think my stat line was sixteen points, twenty three assists, eight rebounds. Um, broke the record and this was my second year in the G League, and by this time my numbers were like that. That was like my around like my peak in numbers but sure. I've been playing well right um up until that time I hadn't really garnered much interest not to my knowledge and then we were slated to fly to Santa Cruz uh the next day so the next day we fly to Santa Cruz as soon as we get to the hotel I get a call from my agent he's like did you unpack yet I'm like nah he's like don't unpack because <laughs> you're getting called up right to Philadelphia wow. and they're about to fly you out and you know that that instant, right, was like, you know, it was just the okay. Now is your chance, right? Like, sure. You're getting, you're getting called up. You're you're getting you're gonna get your opportunity to go play in the NBA, right? So, from that moment to the to, to the moment, you know, I'm I'm in the locker room. I'm I'm with Philly. You know, I'm, I I see Coach Brown. Like I see all the players, and, and I'm getting acclimated. And you know, again, it hits like you know, this is your chance, right? This is your chance. This is your chance. And then the first three or four games, like, I don't play. <laughs> sure. And it's, so it's just like, it, it shows you, right, this is a business. At the end of the day, you know, you stay ready, you stay professional, and, and, and you stay, um, uh, uh, what's, the, what's the last word, uh, available, right? Like, sure. obviously, there, there's some guys who, you know, are good enough to play, but then, you know, for whatever reason, barring injury, whatever the case, right, just not ready or not available, so – it's you know there's a there's a sliver of luck that you have to have um it, there's all all these different factors that kind of play into like why you're here what you you know if you're going to be able to actually get time on the court or maybe they're just looking for you to like fill in a role for somebody who's kind of like you know on the trading block or like maybe somebody who's injured or they just kind of just need you as like you know a backup just in case like whatever the case may be it kind of just taught me to stay like walk that middle line right not to have so many expectations I but see. to just, like stay in the middle just so that like just in case anything happens like you're ready you're professional right and that's what sure. I learned. Like, that that whole process taught me how to you know remain a professional and Oh, you're good. You're good. So, so you were bouncing around the NBA and then you played in the G League as well during this time. What was it like in Sioux Falls? I was Sioux that Falls. eye-opening? I mean, that had to be eye-opening and, and certainly humbling. I, I, I really, really appreciate Sioux Falls, the Sky Force, and the organization. Like, everything from, from the top to the bottom, man, it's, like, such a first-class organization. Like, if, if, I, if I could play anywhere in the G League or, like, anybody who I've spoken to about the G League, I've always been like, yo, try to go to Sioux Falls. Try to go really? To okay, Falls. cool. Yeah, just because, man, like, you know, there's not much to do. Like, if, you, if you're going to contemplate playing in the G League, you have to know that you're not getting paid, right? You're not – this isn't for the money. So this is because you believe you have a legitimate shot to get to the next level. So if you believe that in yourself, then put yourself in the best position to get better, right? And I don't think there's a better place to get better in the G League than Sioux Falls. What was your 
welcome to the G League moment where, like you said, there's not a whole lot of glitz and glamour. Everybody is in it to get to the next level. It's an arduous road during that time. But like you said, it's very character building as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. Nah, so I want to say the first year I was there, um, I'm on the team with Bill Walker. Okay. Who I used to, I used to like, I used to watch him, uh, like his highlights in on YouTube and like Ball is Like, because he used to play with OJ Mayo. And like that next class, the 07 class, was like, you know, D Rose, OJ, Bill, uh, uh, Eric Gordon, like, you sure. know, Jared Bayless, like all of those guards and like those people. So, you know, I looked. I looked up the bill, like, in a sense. So now I'm playing with him. You know, he's had time in the NBA, but now he's back in the G League also. So, like, it was one of those, like, oh, shit. Like, and then uh, we, we had Quincy Dooley on our team that year, too. And, you know, I knew about Quincy and his career also. So kind of just looking at these at these two guys, like, you know, now the, these are, you know, my, you know, my, my teammates, right, moving forward. So the story is Quincy, we went through training camp. Like two weeks, three weeks of training camp, two days. It was tough. Um, the first two games of the season, we we're playing. I want to say uh, they they started me at the one that had Quincy at the two, even though you know Quincy can play the one and the two. Sure. But Quincy, I think he he had he might have averaged like thirty one or thirty two or something like that his first like two or three games in the G League, and then we get to practice the next day after he had this one like huge game. He went off like forty some, and. We can't. We come to practice the next day. Quincy's not there. Somebody asks, like, "Yo, where's Quincy?" And then the coach is like, "Oh, he just went to China. Like, they just they just wow. offered him like like a million some and just called him to go play in China." And I was like, "Hmm, <laughs> like yeah. it, it can happen that fast, right?" Like, and I guess that's when it hit me. Wow. That, like, again, if you come here, you put in the work, you do what you're supposed to do. It, 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 it that's all it takes. Like it could just take the blink of an eye for somebody to take notice, whether it's overseas or an NBA team, and and you know you you can get to where you, wherever you want to go. Um, you know, for for those people who legitimately legitimately believe in themselves, like I said, the G League is definitely a place for players to better their game and to build character. You you certainly have built a lot of character through your persistence and perseverance with your career what did it feel like when you not only showed out at UCLA but then you got your chance in the NBA and you got on the floor for all those in the past who were criticized of you know whatever in, in North Carolina but for you to say hey look I've turned my life around I am a better person because of it and now I'm in the NBA I, I can't even imagine Larry what that must have felt like for you yeah, I mean, it was, you know, it was, <laughs> I, it was one of those things where I could have, I, you know, part of me was like, oh, well, you know, see, you're good enough to be here, right? Like, yeah. you, you were right all along, and, and sure. you had what it takes, but then I didn't want to give into that side, because then it was just about, it was just about me getting to this point, right? Like, you know, I felt good enough to make a lasting impression and to, and to remain in the NBA as well, right? So, it's like these little mind games that I was playing with myself, like, on this journey, but then once I got there, um, you know, all I, like, all it taught me, again, was to just remain in the middle, because you can't, like, you can't go into situations thinking like, well, you know, how much am I going to play? Like, I want to play this. I'm going to play that. Right. It's, it's literally, you're going to psych yourself out. And so much of the game at that level is mental. Um, and then for me, like, you know, learning kind of just, you know, the whole, the whole, my entire uh, journey, right. From, from Carolina to, 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 to my red share year back to UCLA to G league, um, there's definitely been a lot of ups and downs, right? And so, you know, at the one thing, like like I said, that I learned was to just walk that middle line always. And, and you know, to, to, to remember, man, like, you know, I'm getting paid to play, you know, a sport, like a game that I love. You know, I was talked to by my father who had played for as long as he played. He knew the game. Like, you know, I've been blessed to have, like, all of these resources in my life to, to um, you know, to, to, to walk down this path and to go on this journey. And, you know, at the end of the day, I was just, you know, I was, I was happy. You know, I was happy at the end, like, no matter what happens, like, just the fact that I was able to say, hey, look, I did this, you know, I'm, I'm going to continue to do it for as long as I can until I can't anymore, you know, until my back gives out, whatever the case may be. 
what she did, but <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just it's just one of those stories, man. Like I like you know, I really felt like I gave them all. Like uh, over the course of my life, like I started playing basketball ever since I was I was like three, like four, like organized. I was like playing in like little YMCA rec leagues at like three or four years old. Um, so you know. I, I gave the game like everything I had up until that point, and then I, I you know, um, you know, I just said whatever was gonna happen was gonna happen. I was gonna be happy regardless. So I feel like you, you're happier. You've learned so much, like you said. I mean, at that age, we're still learning. We're in, we're in college. We're trying to figure out our own lives, and you were able to figure out and find your path and what made you happy. And I, I'm, you brought up your dad. I'm sure he's happy of what you've been able to do. I wanted to ask you, my, my final question was, what was it like for your dad to play with Magic Johnson? And had he ever showed you or, or told you any stories about Magic that you said, well, that's, that's where the greatness came from? Something that wasn't, you know, maybe in the locker room, it was something Magic said or was just like, okay, <laughs> that guy's really good. Well, I mean, so my father and Magic actually had a, a, or have a, a very close relationship and then growing up I I used to call him Uncle Buck but then like okay uh, my, my mom at one point was like you know just so that you know this is your godfather so magic is wow. actually my godfather and wow like, I, oh, cool. I grew up around him and his kids and like the family and, like it was just those things where you know both families got to like enjoy each other's presence like I'll be my dad and Magic both, you know, worked together for the Lakers and playing sure. together. And then my dad was, you know, an assistant coach right after he retired. So um, the Lakers and that whole, you know, early 90s organization, like, you know, Showtime uh, pretty much grew up around. And, you know, like we had the suburban truck with the TVs in the back of the headsets, like right, like the, like 96, like right when it first started becoming a thing. And then sure. my dad used to have – the Lakers video uh, video uh, editors, like, they used to make me long compilation videos of, like, ball handling crossover tapes from, like, Magic's career, Isaiah Thomas, like, Allen Iverson. Like, pretty much everything that you see now, right? Like, on YouTube. Like, if you just want to go on YouTube and type in, like, oh, like, a Handles mixtape or whatever. Like, I, I was I was watching Handles <laughs> mixtapes since wow. I was, like, five or six, bro. And, you know, again, like Magic, the Magic Johnsons, the Nick Van Exels, like Nick was like probably, probably is one of my favorite point guards of all time. Um, and, and you know, just like the likes of those guys, like Damon Stoudemire, uh, uh, Steve Nash, Jason Kidd, like just all day long just used to watch just all these different, you know, styles of, of, of basketball, right? And my dad used to tell me like, you know, you never really want to watch just one person, or at least that's not what he did. He kind of like took – a little bit from everybody so that's kind of how sure. i grew up i never had one person that i used to watch and model my game after it was just you know i took a little bit from everybody and you could tell that that was part of your game and you were ingrained with all of this talent and being around all these great players and how that that basically trickled into your own skill set and what you were able to do on the court this has been really fun larry i i've been so grateful to have you on the show let's do this again sometime and yeah bro anytime bro I, I'm grateful for you. I'm I'm really grateful for this. And I know a lot of fans can find you on Twitter. It's underscore Larry Light, right? So that's where they can find yeah, you. Yeah, underscore on. Larry Light. And then my Instagram is uh, Larry.Light. Larry.Light. You can find him on Instagram, Larry.Light. Twitter, underscore Larry Light. I'm on Twitter at Brian Fenley. Larry, I, I'm just... I'm just I'm loving this. And so thanks again for sharing these stories. I know Bruin fans will love this because there's... They're, they're searching for some kind of sports content while we're still in this malaise and this standstill with what's going on. So they're going to really yeah. appreciate it. And they, uh, they certainly loved watching you in your time in Westwood. Well, thanks for thinking of me, man. You know, I'll be around. So anytime. You got it.